So welcome everyone to um, Scottish Rum Festival. These are some um, pre-recordings and interviews that we are going to be doing with some uh, amazing uh, Scottish producers and distillers. Um, and we have for you today, I'm joined by uh, the wonderful Kit Crothers of Ninefold Distillery. So please Kit, um, introduce yourself to everyone. And uh, for those that don't know Kit, I'm sure many of you will, um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and Ninefold Distillery. Yeah, hi Ron, um, hope you're having a good day. Uh, so yeah, uh, my name is Kit, I'm the owner and distiller here at Ninefold Distillery. Uh, I'm actually the only employee here, so it is very much a, a one-man, uh, literally a one-man operation uh, here. Um, and I uh, launched in uh, 2019, almost exactly two years ago now, actually, um, uh, with a, a white rum, uh, which I call my pure single rum. Mm. Uh, I make that totally from scratch here at the distillery. You can still you can see my still behind me. Um, what you don't see is the molasses further down, down the room uh, that I use for my rum. Uh, and in uh, the start of this year, I launched uh, my spiced rum called Dormant Spiced, uh, which uses my white rum as a base, and I, I add my flavours to that. Uh, and I've been cask aging rums as well, uh, not quite since I got going, but not long after. Uh, I put rum away in, into barrels, mm. uh, and I've been putting small amounts away uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, I've got a, a, a bond next to the distillery here, which has space for about 300 casks, uh, I think, uh, but there's only about 13 in there at the okay. moment. So I've got a long way before I get it get it filled, but that's that's really where uh, what I want to aim for uh, is to get lots of um, barrel aged stuff uh, put away. But in the meantime, uh, I've had to go with a, a white rum and a spice rum uh, just to get me yeah. going. That's a good starting point though. I mean, um, so we'll, we'll talk about those rums, in a little minute and um i mentioned there i hope you're not superstitious about the number 13 either got, um, <laughs> I, i'm personally not uh, but i might struggle yeah, to sell I don't, I don't know. <laughs> maybe you just keep that as a some sort of like extra limited edition and then <laughs> age it a little bit further um i've actually got we're going to just do a tasting i have your one-year-old virgin american oak your pure single rum so right. ninefold Apologies, there's no um, actual labelling on it. This was sent to me, we picked up first thing this morning. Um, so I think you're going to run me through a little tasting, aren't you? Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. I don't actually have any of my liquor with, with me. Um, the, what was sent out to the festival uh, for tasting, um, because mm. all my cask age stuff is quite precious to me, and, and this is kind of a pre-release tasting as well, uh, I don't actually have yeah. a whole lot of... The stock available i had to draw it spe especially out of my casks uh, to provide the samples yeah. for the rum festival and um rather stupidly i made exactly enough to send out to tasting packs and none for myself <laughs> so but oh, i i have uh, i've obviously did take them in the past so um <laughs> so i'll have to pretend that i'm, that I'm drinking it well it smells amazing already i mean i'm quite excited um and especially uh, I mean, for, for Scottish rum as a whole and rum in general, obviously I'm a big fan of rum and I've got a nickname, Rum Royalty. Um, but when you started, when I first started seeing what you were doing, you know, I was really intrigued by, uh, you know, the communication, what was going on in social media. Um, and I was really excited uh, to get my hands on some of your very first bottlings um, that came out. Um, and then, you know, just tasting them and where they were at and that kind of flavour. And I think a lot of people, um, I think, maybe expected some, like, big kind of funky Jamaican style of rum. But certainly, as I sit here, and those rums really are aromatic that you're producing. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of aroma coming off this. Um, the minute uh, there is. Um, so my, my rum is it's pot distilled. Uh, so there should be um, a lot of uh, interesting things in there through mm. through the, the pot distillation, uh, but I do use a, a small rectifying column uh, as well. And I think most people would expect something that. So this isn't a column distilled rum, no. but because of the extra copper contact and the extra rectification, I think people expect it to be 
a more neutral spirit than it is. Yeah. Uh, so that usually there is the reaction I get, uh, certainly from people who, who drink rum or know the rum category, uh, are expecting a much lighter spirit than I think uh, I've produced. Yeah. Certainly the, the white rum, my unaged rum that I bought at 40%, uh, it's, you know, it's toned down a lot of um, what gets produced on this still. Mm -hmm. But what I've put into casks has gone in at uh, that particular, um, the samples that you're drinking now, I think went in at 63.7 into the barrels. Uh, and then I've only cut it down to 48. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's still plenty of the character of the rum there. They're virgin barrels as well, so uh, inevitably you end up pulling a lot of flavour uh, out, out of the wood, out of that cask. Uh, there's not, been nothing in there uh, up to that point. Um, so yeah, it ends up with a very, very quite full-on um, spirit in a way. It's certainly not, yeah, it's not funky in that way, but it's um, at cask strength, it really... <laughs> it really smacks you in the face with uh, the kind of flavours that are there. Um, and so, yeah, last year, I don't know, Jamie, if you were able to pick up a bottle. I did do a single cask release yeah, last September. Yeah, I missed it, unfortunately. Did you miss it? Oh. I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> gutted. I was searching around uh, last night and this morning, actually, to see if there was anywhere that had it or someone was selling one. Um, completely gutted. I don't know how I missed it. Considering <laughs> that. Um, it you know, it, it sold so quickly. Um, uh, I think it was a combination of cask strength. Mm. Uh, it was 45 quid, so not ridiculously expensive. No. Uh, hand signed, individually numbered, so the, the bottles disappeared very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, I, I only have one myself, um, uh, but I know a few people who, who snapped up kind of multiples when they had, had the opportunity. So yeah, it did go pretty quickly. Yeah. But that, that was done at, yeah. at cask strength, which I think was 59.6%. At, at that point, nice. uh, and that was really, uh, there was so much of the, um, the the rum flavor that came through. So you had all the um, sort of caramelly, uh, toffee, um, kind of treacly notes uh, in there, uh, as well as what it's extracted out of the barrel. Um, so there's not a, a huge oak hit, but it very definitely, mm -hmm is there and certainly on the nose you, you get that that presence as well mm. the the rum which is in your sample uh is di is different actually to what was in the single cask um that's that is basically my white rum that's my standard rum mark uh mm. in in a virgin barrel so it's only been there for a year um but yeah you get a lot of the it's very sweet on the nose yeah um it's certainly very it's extremely drinkable. I mean, that's that's the the thing I I found with it. Um, a lot of people who maybe come at dark spirits, or maybe come from whiskey, and find a lot of whiskies can be quite harsh. There's that whiskey burn um, to them, particularly the higher ABVs. Uh, and with with my rum, I don't find I get that, and a lot of people who drink it don't get that either. Yeah. You certainly get the heat, you get the alcohol heat, but it doesn't. Um, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't make you sort of do the whole cough and splatter and the, oh, wow, that's, that was kind of hard going down. But It reminds me, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot going on in the nose. Um, you keep coming back to it because it, there's, you know, there's, a, there's layers of complexity there. And you first, when it, you first come into it, you know, talk about sweetness and uh, like Tristan Stevenson, Craig Harper, other people that we've done tastings with, they'll go on about you know, you can't actually detect kind of sweetness, but those, you know, whether that we pick up that kind of sweetness that comes out from barrels, you know, vanillins that are in there, you know, just notes that are actually just peaking right up at the top as well. And much like perfume when you're talking about like blends, but, you know, the more I dip my nose into this, you know, you're getting layers of kind of vanilla, you've got butterscotch, you know, dare I say, I was just getting some sort of like toasted banana coming through there. And then if you go back okay. in, there's a lot of like characteristics that are, dare I say it, but there's elements there that are reminding me of some, some mezcals as well. In, in okay. The, um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, with my, my unaged rum, so the rum that, that went into those barrels, when it's, it's fresh, it has a kind of banana bread, smell to it mm. 
uh, it, was, it was a smell that I was really struggling to describe. And then I had um, I, I had a, a chap um, called Lewis Hayes, who owns Fraction House and Black Parrot down in London. He was here for a week and he was like, oh, banana bread. <laughs> and, and then having told me that, I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I can smell that kind of sweet yeah. banana on it. Um, but I have... I have had people tell me, and I and I notice it now as well, that people get a kind of tequila-like mm. nose uh, to it. It it does it tastes nothing like tequila, no. uh, I, I think, no. but there there is a there's a kind of freshness, there's a slight kind of grassiness there, uh, which comes through, um, and I'm not entirely sure where that's from. It, it may be uh, to one of the yeasts that, that I use. Um, I, I get people kind of comparing it to cachata as well in a way nice okay um and it's possible that the one of the yeasts i use uh which is is used to make a uh, similar spirits um mm -hmm. is bringing some of that that flavor through or yeah. some of that nose through anyway but the, is, the, 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 is, the nose is... the nose is a lot lighter than the palate and i think that that surprises uh, mm -hmm. quite a few people okay. they're they're expecting it to be a much lighter rum when they then mm -hmm. go to taste it um, but find that it's a lot darker. There's a lot, there's a lot more darker flavors in there uh, on the tasting. Mm. Well, I see what you mean, eh? It's, sorry, everyone. Just you have to. <laughs> you have to have I'm, I'm just letting you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say. Um, I really do. You know, I do. I absolutely love your rums. Love what you're doing. Um, the, I mean, the aromas are, they're so nice, you know, they're not, they're, for anyone that's, that's watching, we're talking about other things and people that might go, you know, oh, I'm a bit off by tequila and things like that. These are, nothing is unpleasant. They're really, really beautiful aromas that you keep coming back into. And that's one of the things that I, I love most about rums and whiskies and that, that kind of, that flavour composition, the, the aromatics that come off it, what you can actually smell and sense, which is quite primal to us all, and things that we enjoy. And then you take a, a sip of that rum. That's delicious. Okay. Um, and it, for a one year, you know, it's for a one year old, you would think there's a lot more going on in there. There's a real depth of complexity, just a tiny hint of spice, but it's, still like sitting it's still just meandering on the palate just working its way through there you know which is really really nice you get that subtlety of the wood coming through you still get some of that banana that toasted but in my mind toasted banana there's a big sort of butterscotch hit as well kind of almost like um sort of like a buttered caramel um but without having you know it's not because these are, this is a pure rum so there's no uh, adulteration by no added sugars, there's no additives, right. there's no added caramels, etc. Um, absolutely stunning, to be honest. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank I, mean, you. I, I think <laughs> I, I think one of the, the things that's interesting and that the kind of whole craft distilling movement has, has demonstrated is that um, you don't need big age statements on spirits to to, to have quality. Uh, in the bottle, and I think that's something that the the whiskey industry had, at least from my perspective before getting into the industry, is that whisk very whiskey is very much about how old is it, and the older it is, the, the better it becomes, kind of thing. Yeah. And that there's a there's almost a it's almost a minimum like anything below ten year old on a on a single malt is not worth bothering about. Yeah. Um, but then my, you look at like myself and. Uh, new whiskey distilleries, independent distilleries, and other rum producers who are doing, mm. you know, young, young aged products. The quality of spirits, you know, really shines through, and you can really demonstrate that it doesn't. You don't have to have something sat in a barrel for a decade in order for it to be good, mm. as long as the spirit that goes into the barrel is already really good quality. Then the, the barrel is just adding to mm. that. It's, it's contributing to the flavour. But it shouldn't be there to fix a poor spirit, um, and so that's. I, I think uh, I'm hoping that people will realise that that you don't need to say, you know, that, that older is better. Um, yeah. that, that simply it should just be about who's making it, 
how they make it, um, and yeah, what, what you're actually put, putting away to age. So, and for, for sure, I do want to do very, you know, much older age stuff. Yeah. Just stick it at one year age drums. Uh, well, that's experimentation, and that's an, you know, if you look, so you know, it's interesting because people, you know, big sort of tequila lovers, you know, they always go back to like blancos and stuff, and you always get with rum. Uh, you know, older is better, which is interesting because, you know, I worked for 10 years with um, Appleton Estate and you go to Jamaica and you offer someone, now it's a little bit different, but, you know, quite some many years ago, you offer someone like a 21 year old or an, an extremely aged drum and they kind of, they're a bit bemused by it. They're also confused, like, why would I be drinking this? And, yeah. and you know, they look at you as if like, this rum is no better. You know, and their forefathers, their grandfathers, their fathers, you know, brothers, uncles, sisters, mothers, everyone's drinking the younger kind of like very funk, big, funky, you know, heavy ester drums. And it is interesting that, that we go down that way. And I think one of my points, you know, to, to you or a question was, you know, do you think, do you think we've gone that route because of sort of countries and um, restrictions where some countries expect, you know, a rum to be aged two years, you know, by law, or, um, you know, there's a certain, a certain style or that, or they, that precipitates that, that origin or that region. And for me, it's really interesting, I think, for people like yourselves, you know, for people like um, Seawolf, and, you know, I, I was recently, um, just before lockdown, um, I got like one holiday out to, to see friends and I, I was over in New York and I went to Kings County Distillery and they're really innovative. They're really, that's something that's really quite cool. And you now see it, I'm seeing more, I'm seeing more and more of it in the rum. So I think especially in Scottish rum production, you're seeing much, much more of it where, you know, they're not looking at age statement. You know, you're not looking at age statement. Some of the other producers are not looking at age statement. They're looking at, flavor and and i think to some degree innovation would that be right uh i think so um i mean partly sure. that's that's just to do with yeah it's just the economics of setting up a new business you know the 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 people who've gone into doing rum haven't gone in in the same way that you go into making whiskey you set up a new whiskey distillery you'd be looking at spending 10 million quid and as part of that you're you're expecting to basically be making liquid for over three years before you can start realizing any money back into the business. So that's just, that's yeah. the business model. But the business model for rum is that because you can mm -hmm. make and produce a, a rum without aging it, then it, it opens up to much smaller, uh, smaller people like myself and uh, Colin at Jay Gao and yeah. the guys in the Tuga and things. Um, so, that means that you're not your, your business model doesn't rely on having to having to make something that's a certain age. So it does uh, it it allows for more yeah experimentation. Uh, there's no rules on what type of cask or type type of woods you can use for rum in Scotland. So you know that that yeah. opens it up. Just doing basically what what you like. That's good though, and I think. Does that, do you, because in essence, you know, you're creating a pure single rum, you know, so do you feel that you're following the kind of roots of what, you know, we're talking about a new rum classification coming out globally. Um, myself, uh, Justine Matuga, we were talking about this, talking about the Jasmine as well, how, you know, Scotland's not holding, it's, it doesn't hold itself to anything, but there is, you know, in my eyes, there's some incredible innovation coming out across producers and across distillers, use of casks, you know, the fact that people are breaking away from, you know, which, which maybe was look, maybe looked upon at some of the big industrial runs and, and very major commercial runs, global runs, where, you know, obviously, yes, it's about production and a lot of finance is put into it and expense and you want to get a product out, but it's not for just pushing out onto the market you know these products are really well thought of really well cared about you know how the production is uh, you know and what the innovation is going into these and um, 
and where do you see Scottish Rum? Um, and what, what for you are, are the next steps that are coming forward with Ninefold Distillery? Uh, well, so you touched on classification. Um, so for Scottish Rum, one thing that uh, as, a, as an industry we want to try and do uh, and through the Association of Scottish Rum is to have a common language for our industry in the same way that whiskey does. Um, so that producers, um, consumers, and the whole sort of ecosystem uh, around that, uh, buyers, etc. you know, we're all speaking a common language and everyone understands what it is that, that we have um, and what it is that we're, we're, we're producing. So that's something that we are quite keen to promote and just and to pick yeah a, a classification that that's going to work uh, and just and go with that and and, and be proud of it uh, so that when people pick up yeah, a bottle of pure single rum they, they know what they're buying in the same way that people pick up a bottle of single malt or a bottle of blended whiskey and they, they know they know what they're getting yeah. the, the the big challenge um, then is that because of this innovation and because we're all so different is then how do you communicate to people that styles of rum within Scotland? Yeah. Um, I mean, even, I know I keep referring to Scotch, but I mean, that, that is sort of the, the model, right? Um, with Scotch, it then comes down very much to geography or has come down to geography in the past mm -hmm. as a way of classifying. But I think all the lowland whiskey distilleries are proving that lowland really means nothing in terms of style. No. Uh, at all. Uh, yes, if you're at Isla, um, yes, if you're, you're making out in the islands and possibly, I guess, Speyside has a style. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lowlands is from like, cent, you know, Central Belt South, and that's a huge <laughs> regional variation in Scotland. Uh, and so if you look at the, well, as you'll know from your, from the tasting packs, the rum that I produce, the rum that Matugo produces, the rum that uh, Colin produces in Orkney, are all so vastly different and mm -hmm. they're nothing to do with uh, terroir really. They're not to do with where, mm -hmm. where we're based. It's just the, the style that we've gone gone down that route. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite important to communicate uh, to consumers, yeah. uh, styles, uh, and that's something that, that we need to look at uh, quite you seriously. Know, is how, how, do we, how do we do that? So that people, they're not gonna buy a central belt rum and mm -hmm. it's going to be a consistent style uh, and they're not going to buy an island rum that's going to be a consistent style it's going to be yeah heavy um, floral flavored um sweet yeah, whatever it is that we come up with so yeah. so that, that that's quite important and i think from there that allows that gives us a good platform to really go um you know scotland has been very good at uh, being a very small country that really bigs itself up on, on the world stage. And I, I think it'd be great for Scotland to really put our, put our place firmly on, on the map in terms of rum producers. Uh, it's also focused on, on the Caribbean uh, and that, that part of the world and, and yeah. sort of Central and South America. Uh, and it'd be great to kind of add Scotland into that conversation yeah. as well. Um, I think that's one of the big keys. I think you, you, I think you've said it correctly, which is communication, which has then got me think. Because I'm always thinking about, you know, we've got botanical rums coming out. Are they flavoured, you know, and spiced? And I like the kind of simplicity that we are at the moment, the way that we're coming at it with. You know, we're doing pure single rums because the language of whiskey can be quite difficult sometimes. Even you know, people in whiskey or think they know whiskey for a long time. And then they're subjected to maybe statements that they don't understand. You know, some single malts are obviously a range of blends of that whiskey from that distillery coming in. And there, there might be older years in there and it's the youngest year. And then we look at what we're doing in Scotland. And for me, it's, it's super exciting. It's, I think it's one of the most incredible, exciting categories right now in the market. And seeing what people are doing and how they are taking stock and even some producers that you know they first produced over the course of the last year or 14 months or 18 months they've been sort of rethinking what they're doing and how they're doing it with production um, and and we do have that association with Caribbean some of it you know 
dark history going back, how do we move that forward? And there's an incredible amount of producers that are, you know, using Caribbean rum. And it, it, again, it goes back to that communication. How do we get that communication so, maybe not perfect or correct, but correct to the consumer so that it's, it's the right communication mm. so that they understand what that is. You know, this is a rum that, the rum may have come from the Caribbean, but it's been blended here in Scotland, you know, and it's using maybe forage ingredients, if it's a botanical, it's a spice drum, you know, it's okay. Like your spice drum, there's the use of uh, sugars and natural caramels. Um, you know, I had this argument with someone uh, a while ago, we were, we were just in a, a rum forum um, and they were adamant that, that one of the companies um, didn't use caramels and they did, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, they use it for uh, a colouring aspect. And, and again, it's just making sure that there's that right communication, you know, and how that's received and how do we, how do we move forward with that without, because it's an incredible category. Rum, rum's such an open category. There's so much fun involved. Um, you know, I was speaking to someone this morning and they were talking about Kraken and Captain Morgan and all these other things. And, and there's not, you know, whatever you like, you like. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I think for me, it's purely, you know, about Scottish rum and that relationship with the Caribbean and how people are doing it. And there's so many differences going on right now. You know, you're producing some are blending, some are compounding, um, you know, it's, it's incredible. And it is just getting that communication right. So I think you're completely right there. And talking about, I think going back to history, you know, and, and talking about style, you, it is interesting because you're in the borders, but you're, you know, you're setting a tone for the kind of rum. What, what made you come to that kind of rum style for Ninefold? <laughs> what was it that brought you to, to so maybe tell us a bit more about, you know, your ideas behind Ninefold. Um, the branding is beautiful. Um, the logos, the font, which I really love. Um, choice of bottling. Um, I'm a fan at the end of the day. Um, so what brought you to, to coming about with that, that flavor? Fermentation? Was it a, a separate style that brought it that way for you? Um, this is going to be um, a, a very unromantic uh, answer. It's, <laughs> I'm not going to go in. I, I can't, unfortunately, go into like the whole kind of geekery behind it because I didn't approach it from that kind of angle. Yeah. Um, my, I, I wasn't really a big rum drinker before I got into actually making the spirit. Um, so actually, and this, this is something which uh, you, were, you just talked about communication and just to mm. go back to that slightly, the, the, the implication there it, it is about honesty, uh, that you, when you're communicating, you should be communicating honestly about yeah. what, what it is that you're doing. Because I think uh, as you used as an example, like, like Kraken and Captain Morgans and all this kind of stuff is that it, it shouldn't be about that you're trying to hide stuff. It should just be about that this is what we do and this is how we do it. And, and that's just, just a fact. And the consumer can decide themselves whether that's something they want to buy into or not. And to be honest, most consumers probably still would. They're just happy that you've been on, honest with them. Yeah. So, on, you know, that kind of philosophy has been very much part of what I try and do here. And so I'm very honest about the fact that I don't come from a, a rum geek hobby background at all. Uh, I got into this very much as a as a business choice. Uh, picking a, a spirit I thought was going to do quite well mm -hmm. in a post gin world, if there ever will be one. Uh, and I thought rum might be <laughs> thought rum might be quite a good thing to get into. So so the the process of of pick, picking a recipe uh, and picking a style of rum here was was basically informed by. The, the equipment I bought and when I bought the equipment I didn't really know a huge amount about really what I was buying mm -hmm. it was largely on the advice of the, the engineers and the consultants that I, that I went through but right. what I knew that I wanted was <clears throat> I knew I wanted to launch with a white rum with an unaged spirit yeah. I knew that it had to be approachable I wanted something that was it was drinkable and was appealing to quite a broad demographic that it wasn't going to be something that was really f far out there that 
that um, only the real rum geeks would, would drink. That, that's great, um, but I need to appeal to a much broader market if I'm going to make any money, uh, quite frankly. <laughs> so yeah. so that, that was kind of, the, that, that was sort of the philosophy. Uh, and it was something that I really wanted to work in cocktails to be mm-hmm. uh, a light spirit that you can make great cocktails with, but that was quality and had a flavor to it as well. Yeah. So that was kind of the, the remit behind it. And then when it came to doing, to actually making rum for the first time, it was then just a case of, I, I had, you know, I had a source from molasses. I, I had a source from my yeast um, or yeasts. And I was just playing around really with the, the combination of yeast that I used and then basically working out how the still worked. So it really, you know, I didn't go through like years of different iterations and played around with experiments and doing some illicit distilling, you know, in, in the background at, at home. It was very much, I, I had like two or three months to just smash out a recipe on, on my equipment and, and just get launched. So nice. in, in a way, I, I, and through that, I had a lot of support from other guys in, in the industry. Um, so from, from Colin and Jay Gow and Ross at, at Sugar House, you know, they, they really steered. And um, Ben, who's setting up a distillery on Isla, rum distillery in Isla. Yeah. These guys really helped steer me and, you know, the, the day-to-day sort of, how do I do this kind of thing? So I, 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 I owe a lot to, to those guys. Um, in, in a way, I, I, I'm going to put myself down here, but in a way, I do feel like I... I I don't want to say I flute a good spirit, um, but I didn't come at it with a huge amount of knowledge. And so the spirit I produced, um, it, yeah, I, it wasn't intentional, let's say. Uh, it's just, it, it is what it is based on the, the equipment and, and the materials I use here. But having done that, I'm now very, uh, I'm very conscious that I have produced a very good spirit and that I need to continue that. Yeah. So uh, I, I can't, I, I have a standard that I need to match now. And now that I know more about how my process works and about my fermentations, uh, then yeah, I'd like to be able to play around a bit more, experiment with different yeasts, um, mm-hmm. play around a bit with kind of dunder as well, see how that goes. Okay, interesting. Um, but that's, that's not really, I, I produce a, a, a light, or I say light spirit, it's a lighter spirit than I think some guys produce, yeah. uh, certainly compared to Matuga um, or, or Jay Gao. Um, and that's kind of my style. Um, so although I like to experiment with those stuff, it's unlikely to be, you know, a big thing. Yeah. Um, kind of it, more kind of limited really. expressions or something that's kind of more sort of innovation based, which is really cool. I mean, it's, very, it's interesting hearing you talk because it reminds you of those kind of like old stories about, you know, distillers back in the old days of especially whiskey or even some of the first starts of rum. You know, if you look back to do a lot of history and, um, you know, I come from a background, I've done a lot of uh, historical work uh, and research. And, and I love that. I love the fact that you, you know, you had an idea, you had an approach, you had a eureka moment in a way. I wouldn't say that you fluked, you know, fluked, let's say, I, I would call that a, a eureka moment that was just going through my head there, you know, and it's just through process as well that you've done that, which is incredible. And now you have this kind of standard run and you know where you want to take it and there's elements of that, which is amazing, you know, and you've got the, the kind of building blocks now uh, to carry that on. Which I yeah, very, very definitely. Um, and it, I mean, for example, the, the, the rum that I, I produced, that I've casked, is is my standard standard rum mm. but i think there are i could make a better rum for putting into barrels so that's something that i i want to to look at so as good as my my barrel aged rum is uh it could be i th- think it could be better uh, and there's there are things that i can do to mm. make that a better you know, better you know there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that honest approach that's in my eyes i think that's that's the beauty of it you know and also you know, we're always constantly learning. You know, it's always good to learn something new, to learn something off another. There's nothing wrong with, you know, you have a business plan, you adapt the strategy, you change, you apply. Especially, I think the last the last kind of year, last 14 months, there's been, you know, so many people rethinking, having to re-strategize, be creative, 
maybe can actually slow down a bit. You know, I know I'm susceptible of that. Um, there's times I've gone out there and spoken about stuff and I feel like I've jinxed myself and then I need to sit back again and just rework and re rethink things. And I think that's the beauty of it. And like you say, that comes back to communication. So there's that honesty approach that you're, you know, I think that's so, for consumers, I think that's such a positive thing as well, you know, and how you are putting that message across, you know, and there's no, there's no negativity. There's no, we're not, we're not discussing other brands in any other way, or, you know, we're just purely looking at what's defining, you know, Scotland and each individual producer. Um, and certainly you're, 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 you're on the, the, the pathway of that and that's your journey, which is incredible. Which I think is correct. I think that's it's such a, a beautiful thing to to have to 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 want and to speak about as well. And I think that's that's production. You know, it's organic as well. There's so many things that can change constantly, and you know, to be able to apply those things or today and say, you know what, and it's not to say I think you know maybe it is right to say you can make things better. I mean, this is beautiful rub at the end of the day, quite simply. Um, and I'm I'm keen to I was you know keen to then try your 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 spice drum, the dormant spice, and then move into that. Um, because once you become you know you see something that's happening, and as a, a kind of rum lover, you then look at these products and go, Do you know what, actually cool. And there's also a diversity, like you say, in Scotland between Matuga, you know, Jay Gow. There's so many little differences happening with innovation. Um, so what? So th are those the next steps for you? You think? Coming ahead for ninefold to to innovate. Do you mean to do or, some innovation to to um, take the brand down that route? Yeah, possibly. Um, and one one thing I'd like to do actually is um, so my my unaged pure single rum is bottled at forty percent. Um, I am probably looking in the future at, at upping that ABV uh, mm. as um, as drinkable as it is at 40%, it inevitably, when the bulk of what's in the bottle is water, then you do lose uh, some of the character to the rum. And, you know, when I'm making up rum here to cask strength at whatever, 63 and a half, or I'm doing it at navy strength at 57, yeah. just the, oh, it, it just, the, the smell and the experience of it is just so phenomenal. And by the time it's gone, you reduce it down to 40, yeah. You do lose some of that character. Um, and so I'd probably look actually to uh, bottle at a higher ABV uh, in the future. I'm, I've still got like 3,000 labels I need to kind of work through. So I'd rather <laughs> not have to yeah. chuck those away. Absolutely. Um, but that, that's something I'd, I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to look at doing um, possibly some other flavoured rums, but we'll, we'll have to see. That's, you know, my... Um, my core, my heart, really is is the the unadult. Un can't even say it. The unflavored stuff, <laughs> uh, the, the the pure pure single rums, whether that's un unaged or, or aged. And yeah, and I do need to work on uh, a couple of a couple of other uh, base rum recipes um, for casking, uh, and and also just for there, there's a market now for other Scottish producers who are looking to get into the market and they want, uh, and this is really, really nice to see, is there are rum producers who, who genuinely want a quality base spirit to make their products with. Yeah, that's true. Um, so rather than going buying the cheapest, whatever, commercially mass produced rum and, or neutral spirit that they can, they can buy and flavor it, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I get inquiries of people looking, they want to buy Scottish rum, they want something that's quality yeah. to make their spirit from. Um, so I'd like to, to have something that's available uh, to, to people like that, that, um, that, you know, I can be part of their their journey and, uh, and, and get them going. A lot, a lot of these guys are looking to start their own, you know, make their own rum eventually yeah. from scratch, uh, but they want something to get, get them going. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is is really gratifying, and, and that's um, that you know, the fact that people actually want to use my use my rum to make their own products is, you know, is is a great sort of confidence booster. Uh, you know, they they see it as something that's you know a quality spirit, and they want to enhance it and, and sell it, and make some money. Yeah, and enhancing it in the, in the right way. You know, you look at you know, uh, 
something I won't discover. It's not not about me today, you know, this is all about you. Um, but it's good to hear things like that. You know, that's something that that I'm quite positive about, you know. Um, and I think there's there's so many benefits there for something that you're doing, you know, and how you can then work with others as well, or they have the ability to do that. And um, definitely something I'll be talking to you about, I hope, um, at some point quite soon. Um, but it's been amazing. Um, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to be able to come down uh, to Ninefold. Yeah, uh, I, I was going to say, um, you talked to, we talked earlier about the smell of, uh, you know, from that, the Cascades drum, literally the, the best smells in the distillery. One was when I was filling the barrels to begin with. Nice. And then two, when I was bottling that liquid afterwards, like the, the whole place just smelled of like mm. cookie dough. Um, yeah. And it was just this, oh, <laughs> you're like, how am I actually going to get any work done? Uh, so yeah, to, to experience that is... is oh, uh, something different. And then, then, you know, it's also that you can come down, you know, you're never going to get everything you want from kind of 30 minutes here. And this is a really nice introduction and being able to speak to you. But there's, for me personally, there's a, a huge difference of actually going into distillery, you know, having that person there, you know, letting them, t you know, there's geek factors that you love talking about as well. For some people, it's just about the enjoyment, the flavor as well. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited that things are opening up and be able to come down and actually come down to Ninefold at some point, spend a bit of time with you uh, and actually see the distillery. And I hope others will do the same as well. Um, now that things are starting to relax too. I do. So I do offer tours um, at, at the distillery. So yeah, through through my website, you can you can book tours and, and come down and uh, or come up and, and see see the place, um, see the casks, smell the oak in my warehouse and, and things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it 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 all adds to the experience. Brilliant. Well, sounds amazing. Yeah, thank you so much um, for. Uh, joining me today uh, and letting me talk to you um, and hearing more about Ninefold. Um, genuinely, I am a massive fan. Uh, one of my favourite rums at this moment in time. I think this age drum is spectacular. Uh, I'm going to have to look. I, I'm hoping someone might squeeze a wee bottle out in the auction or something, even if I have to <laughs> pay a little bit over the odds for it. Um, I, I think it's worth it. in touch with someone, actually. So. Oh. <laughs> let's do that let's do that but thank you very much for your time um, oh, thank everyone, you I mean, Kit will be a part of Scotch Rum Fest um, keep your eyes peeled um, watch out for the Instagram get in touch with Kit uh, Ninefold Distillery um, uh, for any any products you want great website as well beautiful pictures great images um, and I can verify an absolutely delicious rum as well Kit well thank you Jamie it's been really nice to you Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for today. And uh, cheers, everyone. Thank you very much. Cheers.